Uh, and welcome. My name is Andre Marcou. I'm the director of ERCST. I'm here with uh, Jake Wurtzman, who is the uh, lead negotiator for the EU uh, and in the UNFCC process, and senior advisor to the uh, to the director uh, to the DG of uh, DG Klima. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to to host Jake again. Uh, we do this is a little bit of a tradition for ERCST in the sense that. At the COPs, we usually invite uh, senior EU negotiators to have a discussion and uh, get a sense of what has happened at the COP. But what is even more important is what is the uh, what what is the the view of the EU or what the outcome of the COP was, and what are the implications that will uh, will emerge for EU uh, policymakers, policy stakeholders. Uh, these are very important things. The, you know, a lot of people say that the UNFCC negotiations are kind of something in another land, in another place, in another galaxy. They are, but they do kind of come back and, and, and haunt us back here. It's not something that goes away. So the discussion about uh, 1.5 and 2 really translated on the high level ambition for the EU. A lot of things will resonate in, uh, in Brussels. But this is something that continues to surprise me because Jake, every time we have the sessions, especially the one before COP, we usually is like pulling teeth, you know, getting people in the room is not an easy thing. It continues to surprise me because one would think that you know, the stakeholders that are in deeply engaged in EU uh, climate change policy should take an active interest in, in what the representatives of the EU go and do in COP. And that is not the case, and it continues to. To be surprised, and that is also now we think about it coming up to the uh, the first stock take that will take place next year. So this is not something that uh, is indifferent. But first, uh, uh, Jake, you can you give us your take of of, of it or take your interpretation because the text is out there for those that are, have an interest to read. There's been a lot of analysis, different people writing different analysis. Uh, what are, what is the EU take on this? How do you see it resonating in, in Brussels? Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Andre. Thanks for convening us. Um, I mean, in, in short, I, I guess you could characterize the outcome from COP twenty seven is a as a a very very modest um, step forward, um, small step forward, uh, in the sense that you know we are trying to with every COP. Um, to build momentum towards their ambition. I don't, I don't think this COP in and itself delivered a great deal of ambition uh, on, the, on the area of mitigation, which is where, of course, we're, we're most concerned about in terms of the, uh, the pre-2030 period. But um, it probably will most be remembered for establishing uh, a new funding arrangement, including a new fund to address loss and damage. And uh, we can get into the details of what that that arrangement and that fund might look like, but um, I think most people would say that that that's what COP twenty seven will be remembered for. It's hard to create a memorable COP in, uh, in the aftermath of Glasgow, which of course set through its cover decision a lot of very specific benchmarks about what pre twenty thirty ambition should and could look like. It gave more focus on the need to avoid 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, global average temperature rise as compared to the, the more um, modest target in the Paris Agreement of two degrees. It focused in on specific areas of policy where everyone would agree if you're going to achieve that temperature target, but also put yourself on a pathway to net zero, you would have to concentrate. So that's phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, uh, phasing down coal, uh, focusing on the non-CO2 gases, in particular methane, um, and uh, uh, overall ensuring that parties continue to focus on opportunities to strengthen their NDCs and to come forward with long-term strategies between now and 2030. So Glasgow set those very high benchmarks, um, and I think that Sharm El Sheikh um, just barely squeaked by by retaining those benchmarks, but but didn't really add a great deal of additional momentum uh, or confidence that these are committed to achieving those those Glasgow benchmarks. Um, so I think that the best that you could say in the area of mitigation for Sharm El Sheikh 
is that the cover decision, which is called the Sharm el-Sheikh Implementation Plan, will be largely a forgettable document, allowing the Glasgow Climate Pact to continue to be the main document that guides the work moving forward on pre-2030 ambition. What Sharm el-Sheikh did do is to establish the mitigation work program, uh, which will continue to be guided by the Glasgow Climate Pact, but provides a kind of a process-based structure uh, for creating by creating the space where parties will now discuss in more and more detail with more focus um, how it is that they are reaching those Glasgow benchmarks in the pre-2030 period. It was important to keep pressure on pre-2030 because, of course, next year uh, in, um, in the United Arab Emirates, we will have the first global stock take for the Paris Agreement, which is the first formal turn of the five-year ambition cycle under the Paris Agreement. And that global stock take will focus on developing NDCs for the post-2030 period. And so all you have to keep pressure on pre-2030 now will be the Glasgow Climate Pact and this mitigation work program. Absolutely essential because, as we know, uh, the science tells us that uh, you have to focus on the near term if you're going to avoid 1.5. And the post-2030 targets um, are uh, important, but not good enough to drive enough ambition, ambition in the near term. So again, what, what I think that Sharm will be rem remembered for more is this uh, establishment of a new funding arrangement, including a new fund to assist developing countries, particularly the vulnerable developing countries, to respond to the challenges of the impact of climate change with a particular focus on addressing uh, the impacts of climate change. So that's under the under this category of uh, of loss uh, loss and damage. But before we we get into that, maybe just to give a little bit more kind of a color of, of what what was happening in in Glasgow, um, I think the Egyptians were pretty well aware that before the COP started that it would likely produce a relatively disappointing outcome on mitigation. <clears throat> Why is that? Well, first of all, Glasgow basically invited all parties to come forward with new targets, uh, new NDCs and new long-term strategies. But by the time we reached Sharm el Sheikh, it was pretty clear that while some 29 parties came up with additional NDCs, they were either from relatively small economies or they were from big economies with very minor adjustments to their NDCs. So the impact of, of those additional targets was not going to be significant in terms of the synthesis reports that the, uh, the UN produces to see how far we are away from a pathway to 1.5. So there weren't going to be any significant new deliverables of NDCs or long-term strategies. So the Egyptians were careful not to create a lot of expectations that Sharm would deliver in quite the same way that, that Glasgow, Glasgow did. They also, um, so the way in which they tried to manage those expectations is to say, well, this COP will be focused primarily on implementation rather than raising ambition. That helped them to create space for two things. One, for those parties that have begun to implement, the COP would give them the space to talk about the challenge of implementation. And that included the EU uh, with our Fit for 55, but it also importantly included China, uh, which is very keen to talk about the steps it's taking to implement its existing targets, but didn't want to feel under pressure to raise its existing NDC. Um, but it also included the United States uh, with their uh, relatively new climate legislation, uh, Australia, um, and uh, in fact, created a space for India to, to announce their uh, new um, long-term strategy as well. So focusing on implementation took the pressure off both Egypt in terms of being able to deliver NDCs, but also on parties that were reluctant to, to raise them. The focus on implementation also allowed Egypt to focus on finance because they, like uh, many large developing countries, um, like to point to the gap in the provision of finance by developed countries to developing countries as the key implementation challenge. They say, if you, if you want us to implement um, you've got to provide more more financial resources. So a focus on implementation also swept into the conversation more and more of a focus on um, on finance as well. Like every COP, uh, this COP is constrained a little bit by the mandates that it receives from previous COPs. 
So in terms of the substantive decisions that this COP was in, intended to take, uh, they really were, in terms of headline significant decisions, only two areas that people were looking for um, outcomes on. One was the mitigation work program that, that I've already mentioned. That, that was something that had to be decided uh, at, at this COP. And then the other, uh, which really only became clear as an expected outcome after the agenda was set, was an outcome on financial arrangements for addressing loss and damage. Um, the G77 came into the COP with a very, very strong demand that this COP would have to create an agenda item dedicated to that challenge. Uh, they managed to succeed in, in getting an agenda item in place. And so as we moved from the start of the COP to the end of the COP, um, eyes were really primarily focused on the deliverable around the mitigation work program and um, deliverable on funding arrangements uh, for, for loss and damage. So I'm going to stop there and see whether, Andre, you want to direct me in any particular, with, with any questions in any particular way um, to, yeah. to give more details. Look, uh, Jake, I think this is interesting. Uh, if you are on the ground there, first of all, this was quite a large cop. I think that was the largest or the second largest, somebody said. So there was a lot of people, a lot of people there. It was big distances to cover, so you had to run. So that makes it a little bit difficult, especially if your knees are not holding too well. Uh, but also, you know, we saw turmoil at some point. Uh, Vice President Timmerman kind of threatened to walk out. No, but uh, what I'm saying is not that whether he wanted to really walk out or not. But what what was the what was behind that? What was the the, the unhappiness? Obviously, the EU must have been unhappy enough to say that. Yeah. Well, first of all, kudos to the Egyptians for organizing the COP well logistically. So, I mean, it, it was I don't know, I don't know how many people arrived at the end of the day, but it, it must have been more than thirty thousand uh, participants uh, over the course of uh, of the two weeks, and uh, kind of particularly con contrasting it with Glasgow, where you had to get up at the same time in the morning, but you would get up to you know, a dark and drizzly Glaswegian uh, winter day uh, to be able to get up in the sunshine of, of, uh, of Sharm el-Sheikh um, was, was helpful in, in maintaining spirits uh, over the course of, of two weeks of negotiations. But yes, um, so if, as I was describing before, the, the two main expected outcomes were something on loss and damage and something on mitigation where you know, the, the politics of achieving either was challenging. Um, you can imagine that this created a kind of a deadlock in the COP because there, there weren't any obvious trade-offs between the two. Uh, and there was a strong push from the G77 on loss and damage and a strong push back from uh, essentially the industrialized world trying to get more deliverables with regard to mitigation, but in particular to target the major economies, uh, China and, and India and others that, that were unwilling uh, to budge. And we'd seen from the previous G20 leaders, uh, ministerial events um, from, from earlier this year, that the emerging economies were pushing back against Glasgow. So you know, we were insisting on Glasgow plus, they were insisting on Glasgow minus on the, on the mitigation side of things. Um, they wanted a loss and damage fund that would uh, serve all developing countries equally and that would maintain the existing donor base. And so there was very little movement there. So the, the, the critical moment where the, the EU stepped forward, um, first threatening to walk out and then presenting a possible landing ground on the table uh, was basically our saying, okay, uh, we can see a way towards supporting the creation of a new fund on loss and damage uh, here at this COP, but under several conditions. First of all, that fund would have to focus on the particularly vulnerable because it's only in that circumstance that we would see it as adding value to the many existing funds that we've created over the years, which for which all developing countries are, are eligible, but also being able to attract the funding from donors because donors aren't interested in providing uh, unlimited resources to any country labeled as developing in 1992, but they might be uh, willing to put additional resources into a fund that was focused on particularly vulnerable countries and communities. 
So that was the first condition under which we would accept the establishment of the fund. The second condition was that we wanted to see that this fund would be able to access resources from beyond the conventional donor base. So we wanted to show, see clear evidence that this fund would be designed with an open mind as to where more resources could come from. Uh, that could include expanding the donor base to uh, draw in support from countries categorized as developing in 1992, but now have GDP per capita that are significantly larger than some EU member states. Um, but it also could tap into flows from what we call innovative sources of funding. So that could be anything from uh, you know, international airline passenger taxes uh, to uh, you know, additional resources being raised by the multilateral development banks, et cetera. So that was our second condition. First, had to focus on the particularly vulnerable. Second, had to be open to resources other than just the conventional donor base. And then, uh, because we, as all we always do in these COPs, uh, are, are aiming at a balanced package, we wanted to make sure that our openness to establishing a fund uh, at this meeting would garner support from our usual progressive allies in this process, the developing countries, to push on the emerging economies to commit to more mitigation ambition. So no Glasgow minus, but Glasgow plus. So those were the conditions that uh, the, the, uh, the EVP laid down on 10 o'clock on Thursday night, uh, the evening before the COP was scheduled to conclude as a way of trying to break the deadlock. Uh, now, by that time, of course, we had texts on the table and in development being produced by co-facilitating ministers on, on each of these uh, streams. So it wasn't a proposal that was being uh, presented in a vacuum. It just required the adjustments of texts to align with, with those, those expectations. Um, it came as a bit of a surprise to the process. I think it came as a bit of a surprise to me that we made this offer. Um, but it was after some pretty careful consideration and a ministerial coordination that we had um, several hours before the plenary at which he, he made this uh, this offer um, and had the support of all the EU ministers present. And it did significantly change, change the dynamic uh, uh, of the negotiations. Um, they continued in parallel, but we already saw uh, after that announcement was made much more progress on the mitigation front with stronger language being introduced by the Egyptian COP presidency, but with the support of more and more countries into both the cover decision, which is now called the Sharm el Sheikh implementation plan, uh, and importantly, into the mitigation work program as well. And then we also obviously saw more intensive uh, progress on the, on the design of the, um, the funding arrangements uh, and, and the fund. One, if you uh, want to make sure that the, the people on online can uh, raise their hand and then you can put them on the screen so they can say whatever they, they need to say because there are about 120 people there. So we want to make sure that they have a chance. Uh, if there are questions in the room, I have a whole long list here because this is my role to make sure that we keep people going. But I, on the other hand, you did make it here. Maybe you may have your own questions or, or uh, things that you may want to raise. Please raise your hand and, and go ahead and do it, or else I will continue to uh, to uh, to this discussion with with Jake. But again, you can have the floor if you wish to. Just raise your your hand. And... No, okay. So I have the. Uh, you have this. Okay, thank you. So we have. We have two. We have two hands up, and oh, it sounds like I can do it from here. Oh, uh, and I have first. I will. It's somebody you probably know, Jake. I promoted a couple of people. If I can more move to do this, but it doesn't look like to, it's moving to for me to get. Is this computer okay? Uh, I think I can do it as well. Okay. Well, you guys, yeah, okay. Uh, one person that you may know here that I have is, you know him, Emilio Sempris. Mm -hmm. He has a question, the former minister of Panama, but there are a couple of other people here that I think they will want to introduce yourselves to themselves. So uh, you have two, I can't see that people have been promoted. I'm not quite sure how to do this because it's not my computer. They are promoted. I know that they may be promoted, but I don't see them on the screen. So that is not helpful. 
Give me a good challenge. <laughs> uh, okay, see if you want to, 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 to help me with this. See, meanwhile, while we, we make sure that we know who is there, there's this issue of liability that, that has come up and I think was part very much of it because this is such an important thing. You raised it as being an important element. Uh, in, in the loss and damage fund, there was this issue of liability that the US is brought repeatedly. I think all most developing countries have brought it up. <clears throat> how does it land? How does it, does it mean anything for the future? Is still something that, is, because there are a lot of people walking around with reparation, reparation, reparation. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, for, for the uninitiated, it's, it's confusing. Right. Um, so, I mean, from from the the original convention framework convention, there was an acknowledgement that um, that developed countries needed to provide support for vulnerable developing countries experiencing the impacts of climate change, and that was what was originally referred to as adaptation. Uh, and um, there there has been support flowing to those countries under the various financial arrangements that we've already agreed to under the convention, and then under the Kyoto Protocol with the adaptation fund. And then on the Paris Agreement, loss and damage is a bit different because it, it focuses uh, the issue much more on what happens after an extreme climate event or slow onset event occurs, and a country is struggling with rebuilding or recovering in, in the kind of post impact uh, period. When it was first raised as a concern, some um, of the parties, the developing countries, raised it as an issue of liability and compensation. And when they did so, they were suggesting a legal theory behind why it is that a party like the EU should be uh, prepared to support vulnerable countries as they experience the impacts of climate change would be a theory of liability and compensation of the kind that you find, for example, in domestic law, if um, one actor carries out a negligent act, and as a result of that negligence harms another actor, they have a legal obligation called a liability to compensate or make whole the party that they've harmed. That's basically the concept of liability and compensation. And um, some parties, particularly some of the small islands, thought that that legal theory should somehow be built into the international climate change regime. So a legal obligation on those with historical or current responsibilities for emitting to compensate or make whole uh, those countries that uh, were harmed by it. The EU and the United States and frankly, China um, did not see that legal theory as having a relevance to the climate change regime as we've been building it. Instead, the idea is uh, that we, we do feel historical responsibility and we do provide resources but we do that in the form of assistance to developing countries as opposed to compensation to developing countries. When we created uh, under the Paris Agreement, a, a, a dedicated article um, called, that, that is re refers to loss and damage and describes loss and damage. It was part of that deal when we included that article to get reassurances from the countries that initially pushed for loss and damage that that article, under the Paris Agreement would not entail liability and compensation. So when the Paris Agreement was adopted, there was a decision that went with it that made clear that Article 8 of the Paris Agreement, which is the article on loss and damage, does not entail anything with regard to liability and compensation. And so when the conversations on the fund started, which was kind of the next step of how you implement Article 8, some parties wanted reassurances that that understanding from Paris carried through to the design of this fund, that it also would not be about liability and compensation. It would be about assistance, but not liability and, and compensation. Um, and that's basically where we landed in Sharm Shake as well. Uh, this is a fund that is not about liability and compensation, but rather about assistance. And you can see it in the plain language of the decision, it talks about assistance to developing countries, particularly vulnerable uh, to the impacts of, of, of climate change. In addition to that, you can find through a rather circuitous route, uh, a reference in the decision establishing 
the financial, the funding arrangement and the fund to a report from the COP CMA that refers to an understanding that was part of the agreement to establish the agenda item, which understanding was read out to include a reassurance that this fund would not be about liability compensation. Can I tell you what, Jake, I, uh, you know, the COP is interesting, but one of the benefits of, of the COP, which is a side benefit, if you want, is the fact that you run into a lot of people, that sometimes you run around the world trying to meet them. And whether, you know, actually, if you see some Brussels, I, I saw Peter Diesel, I ran into him on the corridor, which mm -hmm. probably I have to have a long appointment date in order to meet Peter here in Brussels. But I met with quite a few of the, the business, European business associations who were concerned because there has been all kinds of declarations that this would be a windfall tax on, 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 on oil and gas or electricity or this was, is this something that resonates? Is it something that your business or industry in Europe should take seriously or this is something somewhere in the future that may not come to pass? How, how, how does that sound to you? It's something that's been raised. I was actually reading a couple of reports this afternoon in preparation for meeting with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was highlighted in those reports. And again, there, there was a number of association kind of raising this. Is this is, should this be a concern or it, it, it should be a concern? Well, I mean, that's more an issue of domestic politics than it is about the negotiations in uh, in Charm. It's clear. So remember those those conditions that the EU attached to supporting for a fund. How many, how many did we get? Well, we did manage to persuade the G77 um, to support the vulnerable countries and to therefore include in the, the um, mandate for establishing the fund that the fund would uh, focus on particularly vulnerable countries. So we, we, we managed to achieve that. Um, the second demand that we had with regard to the design of the fund is that it would be open to receiving resources from uh, other than the conventional donor base. And this is where your question on where where could those fund where could that fund come from? Where could those funds come from? And there is within the terms of reference of the transitional committee that's been established to now complete the design of the funding arrangements that will include a fund. Um, a mandate to to look at identifying and expanding sources of funding, um, including potential sources of funding uh, from a wide variety of sources, innovative sources. So part of the role of this transitional committee will be to look beyond the conventional donor base to, to other sources of financial flows. If you ask people in the quarters, what could that mean? Well, one of the ideas that is floating around is windfall profits. Um, you know, if, if you're trying to create some kind of relationship between um, the, the amount of, of fossil fuels produced, sold, and, and combusted with the, uh, the need for more support for vulnerable countries, it's, it's an obvious um, direction to look. But <laughs> that kind of, uh, of attack, the windfall attack, um, even if it's politically it proves to be politically palatable in a particular jurisdiction, um, it would not necessarily be uh, earmarked for use for a fund like this. You know, there are many domestic needs for additional resources uh, that a windfall tax like that could flow towards, including, for example, in the EU, helping um, poor households within the EU afford the more expensive energy bills that that uh, that, that we're expecting in the in the coming in the coming winters. Um, but there's there, there will be pressure uh, and opportunities to tap innovative sources and taxes, coordinated, harmonized taxes across jurisdictions is, is certainly an area that, that uh, is worth exploring. Well, let me go back to, to the, the people on the uh, on the list here. Uh, Emilio Sempris, are you there? Can you hear us? Emilio? Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Uh... Uh, Andre, uh, I'm still in Sharma, living in a few hours. Um, th thank you for the, for the space and thank you, Jacob, also for uh, taking the time to illustrate on what went on uh, at the COP. Um, just a, a, a quick question that, 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 that I have is that um, we were able to, to include uh, both in the uh, Sharma Chain Implementation Plan and the uh, CMA uh, decisions uh, language on, on forest. 
Um, it is now evident that after about six years of Red Plus implementation, public funding is not going to make it. It's not going to be enough for, for developing countries to, to reduce the deforestation uh, rates. Um, I, would, I would like to, to, to hear what, what you have in mind in terms of a, a, a potential opportunities for, a, for both public and private, private financing for a reduction emission from deforestation and forest degradation. Thank you. Yeah, in my video, I, th I will ask people to introduce themselves because while in the little 40 person, thousand people bubble, many of us know each other, it doesn't necessarily mean this translating into, into Brussels bubble. Uh, Emilio was the uh, uh, former Minister of Environment of Panama and Chair of the Coalition for Rainforest Nations. So he's been quite active in this over the years. Let me go to also to Michael Button. Michael, are you still there with us? Yeah, can you hear me okay? If you want to introduce yourself, Michael, just for people to know. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm from the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change uh, and was uh, formerly with the UK COP26 presidency as one of the finance negotiators there. Um, my question relates to the cover decision text from, from Sharm and in particular the reference there to uh, low emissions energy, which um, obviously has got quite a lot of coverage. I have two questions. One was uh, any insights on the, the sort of the, the process and how, how that that particular language got into the cover decision because uh, there's been various reports uh, about how that worked or didn't and then also your reflections on the implications and interpretation of that both for keeping 1.5 alive uh, but also handling as we look at COP28 in the UAE where obviously the natural gas angle uh, will continue to be there and quite strong. Thanks a lot. Thanks Michael. Uh, um... Uh, Jake, if we take two at a time, I think probably we can focus as it does that, you know, if take too many, then we lose a little bit of focus. So I think interesting one on one on, 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 on uh, low, low emitting energy sources, the other one on, on red plus. Yeah. I mean, I, I was not able to follow every strand of the negotiations and I'm still digesting the text myself. So um, I, I did notice the, the dedicated section on forests uh, in the Sharm El Sheikh implementation plan which I suppose falls a little bit into that kind of Glasgow plus category. Um, but I have not yet unpacked its meaning. So probably the question, Emilio probably knows more about what's, what is intended with that paragraph um, than, than I do. I know that the, the rainforest nations have been trying to kind of break through this, this barrier that's been with us for, for a very long time of um, reluctance of uh, those that are participating in, in carbon markets as potential buyers of offsets to include um, offsets that are based on avoiding deforestation uh, as opposed to offsets that might be uh, based on um, you know, afforestation or reforestation. Uh, and and the, the concerns that, that, um, uh, that, that potential buyers have, I guess, is that there, there seems to be less certainty and more risks associated with generating those, those kinds of offsets. Um, you know, everyone is familiar with the debate, I'm sure. Uh, what, what I just looking at that paragraph 80 where forests are mentioned, um, I mean, I can see it, it continuing to point to results-based payments as a possible source of funding. This is a circumstance where um, a, a donor or an investor uh, provide support for a forested country to help it to avoid deforestation, but doesn't have an expectation of an offset in exchange for that. So the, um, the certification of the emissions reduced are used to demonstrate that the project has generated results, um, but the results aren't then converted into an offset that could then be used to increase emissions elsewhere. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I, I think that that, so my impression is that Although more political attention has been drawn to this issue, uh, that uh, it hasn't been um, resolved uh, in in a significant way through, uh, through the decisions taken at uh, at Sharm. In the in the Glasgow Plus category, so you know elements in the Sharm El Sheikh work program that um, might add a little bit more policy direction than Glasgow was able to provide. There was a big push to include a strong message on renewables, which wasn't given a great deal of emphasis in Glasgow. Push came from many sources, including the, the UNSG, and that long language got in there. 
but apparently it only got in there um, by also including um, this, this language that refers to low emission energy. Uh, there was not a public debate at all about the meaning of what low emission energy is, um, but it clearly is intended to, um, I guess, put in a more positive light the continued use of fossil fuels under certain circumstances. What those circumstances are, I don't know. That's still for parties to be discussing. I mean, you can imagine that it could be um, abated. So maybe low emission means like uh, abated coal, um, an indication that you are offsetting emissions through carbon capture and storage uh, in some way. That might be what low emissions is. I don't think you could say that natural gas is a low emissions fuel simply because emissions from natural gas are lower than that from oil and coal. That, that doesn't seem to me in any way in the spirit of, a, of an instrument that's supposed to be putting us on a 1.5 net zero pathway. So I guess still to be discovered. Um, as I said before, uh, you know what, what's good about the Sharm el Sheikh implementation plan as it relates to mitigation is that it largely repeats everything that was good verbatim from the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, it then has a little bit of plus and a little bit of minus, which I think nets out as a little bit of plus. Um, this is potentially a little bit of minus, um, but I'm hoping that it, it becomes um, one of many things that are in the Sharm el Sheikh implementation plan that are largely forgettable. Uh, and what, be, what remains memorable in terms of providing the policy direction of what we're going to be doing between now and 2030, including through the mitigation work program, is the Glasgow Climate Pact as agreed in Glasgow and as reiterated in Sharm. Thanks, uh, Fiona Ryan. Fiona? Are you still with us? Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Fiona Ryan from uh, Forest Development and Climate in Australia. Um, I was just caught, I was bumping into a lot of people working on Article 6 there, and there was a lot of talk about Article 6, particularly people from developing countries. And I was worried that because the EU, UK, US, Canada have all said they're going to meet their Glasgow, their uh, Paris commitments at home, that we're seeing a repeat of the CDM with a lot of people from developing countries getting really enthusiastic, working really hard, putting resources into getting Article 6 projects up and Article 6 wording in the, uh, in the process. And, um, but there doesn't seem to be a market, so maybe the Japanese and the Koreans. <laughs> And maybe a couple of other countries, the Swiss. And so, um, yeah, I was wondering, I mean, that's not exactly about the negotiations, but I can see the same pattern happening again and a lot of disappointment and resentment around the CDM repeating itself. So any comments on that would be good. All right, thanks, uh, Fiona. Uh, Urmi Goswani. Urmi, are you, are you there? If you want to introduce yourself, please. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'm Urmi Goswami from the Economic Times. I have a couple of quick questions. Uh, you mentioned about you know, mitigation and moving forward on mitigation, and clearly the finance portion is important. What we saw in Glasgow, say in, in Nicholas Stone's report, is that uh, most of the uh, financial flows uh, end up going to OECD countries and our developed markets and China and countries that need to move further on mitigation don't get that much of investment flows. Uh, what kind of work does the EU propose to do uh, between now and COP28 to actually sort of remedy that? Because without that, you can keep having, you know, really great targets, but nothing will happen or you'll have a lot of resistance Okay, uh, so Jake, there... big, big developing countries, and if you see that really as, as as the central problem, and I have one one more question, and and that that relates to a bit of the uh, donor based question. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, even the Paris Agreement talks of develop developed and developing. Of course, it's not the annex, but clearly there's a need to uh, get back to this differentiation conversation. And again, what we have had attempts in the past. You had the equity reference framework. You had the Brazilian that concentric circles. I've forgotten what name they had. 
And I'm wondering again if the EU plans to work on that with with the uh, you know with some kind of partnership with developing countries, uh, maybe other than China, to get that through. Thanks. I think that we're losing the sound. Uh, I think we lost the sound. Uh, uh, we, so, uh, Jake, do you wanna, I think you got a, the, the drift of where we're going on this. Yeah, yeah. So um, let me take the CDM uh, and Article 6.4 question first. I mean, we um, we weren't, if the EU weren't kind of demanders to, to try to continue the CDM experience, experience into uh, the Paris Agreement, but... Um, it was decided that we would have a CDM like like mechanism under Paris as well, where there would be a, a UN established mechanism for certifying offsets that could be made available to countries um, to promote investments, but also to be able to use to offset their emissions. Um, but we've been very careful uh, to, to the speaker's uh, question not to raise expectations that that we will be creating a big market of, of demand around that new mechanism. So if if expectations are being raised uh, such that uh, parties would be disappointed, um, it, it won't be our fault uh, if, if if that if that takes place. I mean, I would I would agree with the speaker that um, there there isn't a lot of of demand for those offsets from uh, from countries because most countries have chosen, I think, rightly, to try to drive emissions reductions domestically by uh, trying to ensure that they're undergoing a transformation in their economies. And, and by using offsets from elsewhere, particularly if they are low cost, high volume, potentially low quality offsets, you don't do that. Um, you you intend, instead take the pressure off uh, uh, the emitters within your economy to, to find the solutions um, of, with with new technologies and new forms of investment, uh, et cetera. So uh, yeah, I, I, I think it is important for us all to manage expectations uh, around the Article 6.4 mechanism. Where the demand might come from, of course, is from the private sector, uh, where you see more and more company companies making uh, commitments to go net zero and in doing so, are you know, struggling, I suppose, to, to, to manage all aspects of their supply chains, and they might turn to six, the Article 6.4 mechanism as well as the voluntary markets as a, as a source uh, for those offsets. In those circumstances, you know, the EU and others are, are very keen to ensure that uh, any of those offsets that are used by companies are not double counted. So if, if they're going to be moving into, in, into any kind of um, anything other than a sort of remote results-based management arrangement that they are ensuring that the host country makes a corresponding adjustment uh, to to ensure that those offsets are aren't double double counted. So yeah, um, not sure what else to say about about that. There were some decisions on six four that show that the mechanism is is moving forward to becoming more operational, including uh, some discussions about how it's developing methodologies for. Uh, certifying offsets and and how it it can transition CDM units into six uh, four units. Uh, Odemi's question about um, finance flows. Uh, it's absolutely true that in, in the world as we as we see it now, um, most of the the finance that's flowing towards uh, the energy transition is uh, flowing within industrialized countries or between industrialized countries. Um, but but much of it isn't. You know, there there is still significant um, investments that are going into emerging economies uh, and between emerging economies as well. Uh, but I think what one of the the things that um, that the EU was was pleased to see emerge from uh, Sharm el Sheikh was a decision to to set up a work program to uh, move towards the implementation of what we call Article Two One C. I know Ermi is very, very familiar with. That's the, the goal within the Paris Agreement that basically says we have to work towards ensuring that all financial flows, not just uh, uh, climate finance in the form of, of public um, uh, development assistance, but all financial flows, uh, north-south, public-private, south-south, domestic, are aligned with the Paris Agreement goals. And I think it's in the context of that work program that this, um, this imbalance of those flows uh, we'll, we'll get the first serious focused conversation 
uh, under this regime. And that, you know, that will look at things like differences in interest rates. It will look at things like enabling environments that, uh, that, that more effectively attract uh, private sector investment. Um, I think it will look at things like taxonomies for investment that help um, countries uh, and investors, public and private, make distinctions between green and, and less green investments. So um, I'm hoping that that will be uh, a space for, for addressing this, uh, this aspect of, of the challenge. Where will equity be discussed? Um, I mean, it's always, it's always being discussed, it seems to me, in, in these negotiations. Um, it's difficult to agree on any kind of collective harmonized standard of, of what equity is. Uh, as Ermi points out, we've tried before. Um, the problem is, is that uh, when you dig deeper into what equity might mean, you find that, that no party, even amongst the developing countries, has exactly the same understanding of what its fair share or another uh, uh, country's fair share of, uh, of the emissions reduction obligation um, should be. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't see us moving towards a standard for equity, but I, I certainly think that issues of equity will will become more and more part of the conversation, and the EU is is supportive of that. Where it obviously will happen um, is within the global stock take, where equity is a cross cutting theme, and so maybe it will have more an impact on the next round of NDCs than it has has had on the first round of NDCs. We certainly hope so. Uh... One before I go to Tobias Brass, I okay. One question for you: What from my side? If you want to say disappointment, I mean, okay, we 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 were disappointed we didn't get this. Is, is what would that be? Because uh, there were a couple of things I think that were asked from the EU that maybe didn't materialize. But if you were to name one, what would you what would you say was really disappointing? I didn't have we we couldn't do this. Yeah, I think it would it would be more of a concrete operationalization, that, that word we all trip over, of the, the Glasgow mitigation benchmarks in the mitigation work program. Um, the mitigation work program is, is pretty vague on what that process will look like to get countries to focus on the opportunities for reducing emissions. Um, and in fact, it contains a um, kind of irritating line in it, um, which implies that um, all this work that we're doing between now and 2030 to encourage parties to do more will uh, be part of a conversation that is non-prescriptive, non-punitive, facilitative, respective of national sovereignty and national circumstances, um, and will not impose new targets or goals. Now, of course, you know, no international negotiation, um, particularly something in the form of a work program, can impose any new targets or goals. Um, but the the nature of the conversation of, of what we should be doing next has been kind of, I don't know, um, cocooned in such soft and protective language. Uh, it, it really does make you wonder how the discussions will really create pressure to drive more action. So I think that's really where we're, we're most disappointed. In looking for Glasgow Plus, we were looking for um, momentum and a stronger push, uh, not something that that seemed to create you know, more of a cushion between the conversation of what countries should do and and what they will do. Tobias Grass, are you still there? Yes, I am, Andrew. Uh, Tobias Grass with the Danish Agriculture and Food uh, Council. Uh, I would like to pick up on uh, the points made by Emilio Sempris and also Fiona Ryan. Uh, I was in the, at the COP uh, and participated in the farmers constituency as such, and as such I had the, the chance to participate in the first ministerial on climate finance, which took place during the first week of the COP. Uh, and uh, in that room, when Mr. Carey spoke about the need for not billions, but trillions of dollars in, in climate finance, and therefore also for markets, it felt as if the Americans were leading the global implementation and, and the global mitigation drive. And so I'm just wondering that look, going forwards towards next year and, 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 and the global stock take, uh, 
if, uh, if it might be time for some strategic reflection on whether what might have been uh, the ambitious point to take uh, uh, some years ago to say that uh, there is uh, uh, the need always for domestic implementation, uh, whether going forward that might actually not impede the EU's ability to lead on mitigation not to use Article 6 and therefore not to be part, but also not, as, as, Ms., um, as Ms. Ryan said, not to deliver the market uh, uh, for, for these offsets. Jake, to add to that, you know, obviously the EU is looking for 1.5 or, or in, in a very strong language of 1.5. I think that that's quite obvious. And that it's, it's you know, no matter how you put it, I mean, that is the language in the Paris Agreement is two as close to 1.5 as possible. So if you go to 1.5, it's an increase in, it, it's, it's an increase in ambition. That's and that's what you're looking for. Is that, considering that we're coming to a stop take next year, is there an expectation that the EU, or is there an expectation being created out there that come up with you? And we just had one from two, mm. to 55, but did we create that expectation that, you know, that people would say, well, you know, you're coming to the stock take and it's going to be another round of, of this discussion and everybody's going to have to show they're doing more? Yeah, oh, so um, I think the, the, the question on, on U.S. leadership through the beliefs of Article 6 um, might uh, apply to the uh, sort of quasi announcement that the U.S. made that they're they're trying to encourage the formation of carbon markets um, through creating a kind of advanced payment arrangement whereby the kinds of companies that I described before that have made net zero pledges could sort of aggregate uh, an advanced payment process for offsets that could be used to help them to meet those pledges and that the US government could play an aggregating role in that process, set some standards uh, about um, what uh, levels of environmental integrity or additionality that those offsets would have to meet um, to, to be able to receive those advanced payments, and in doing so, you know, generate some um, significant investments in, in developing countries. You know, all of that sounds, I guess, fine up, up to a point. Um, uh, they, these we're talking about a voluntary market here. Uh, these kinds of activities don't really affect uh, the NDCs because they wouldn't be used by governments to offset um, their the commitments that they've made under under NDCs. Uh, and you know, as long as the standards are are high, uh, then you know why why not? Um, so you know we we expressed interest in, in that in that happening. I think you have to keep a very close eye on, on those standards um, and uh, uh, make sure that when a com company claims they're going to net zero, they're, they use you know, general, gen genuine, credible offsets to do so. My understanding is that didn't have anything to do with, with Article 6, though. This was something that was operating purely uh, through the voluntary markets, and um, those offsets wouldn't be run through the Article 6-4 mechanism. Uh, the other sort of question, I guess, in, that, that I, uh, the other um, perhaps critique of the EU that I heard implied in the question is, you know, are we by keeping our domestic market, our domestic target domestic, somehow preventing Article 6.4 markets from emerging? Well, uh, maybe, uh, but I, to me, that's kind of not the point. Um, you know, we, we set targets that I think, drive the creation of, of lots of different kinds of markets. I mean, it, it was our renewable energy targets that helped to create global markets in low-cost solar panels. Um, that's our contribution through markets to generate genuine emissions reductions. Um, our experience through the CDM showed that nearly all of the ambition that we set under the ETS was rapidly drained into the production of large volume, low quality offsets. And we don't want to ex repeat that experiment, experiment. And we don't see the Article 6 mechanism as providing sufficiently additional guarantees that the offsets will be of sufficient quality um, that, that, uh, that, that CDM experiment wouldn't be uh, repeated. There is still high risk that the Article 6-4 mechanism, if it does, significant demand 
will produce uh, large volumes of low quality, low cost offsets, driving down ambition rather than uh, uh, driving up ambition. So we're looking for other ways of promoting uh, investment flows into developing countries. Uh, I already mentioned the taxonomy. There is this global gateway where we're trying to aggregate uh, public and private sector investments with a, a, a with an object of, of promoting green and, and digital trend transitions. And um, I think that that's the kind of EU leadership that uh, we would like to continue to, to see. So, Jake, that's you know, you, All right, well, you asked the question on 1.5. You, you and yeah. I know that we this on this one we disagree, but oh, I know we disagree it. on that, Andre. That, 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 <laughs> that's fine. I mean, uh, but what, yeah, so what was the, the, the yeah. other question? Uh, but, so, on, on the GST, so the GST uh, that's coming up next year as uh, in, in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates and in, in Dubai uh, is the first global stock take. As I mentioned before, it has its primary focus on post 2030 ambition. So while we hope that we'll continue to discuss and keep pressure on parties to raise their NDCs that apply to the, the pre-2030 period, like the EU's Fit for 55 uh, package, its real focus is on post-2030 NDCs. So absolutely, uh, it needs to uh, generate strong signals about what the expectations are for the next round of NDCs, including the EU's next NDC, not this one, but the next one. Um, that will that will apply to our uh, to our emissions in the post uh, twenty thirty period, and that will hopefully demonstrate that we're on a pathway in the next five years, the next ten years, following twenty thirty towards uh, towards net zero. So, absolutely, we expect it to drive to help drive the conversation that will happen under the EU climate law, uh, <clears throat> which builds in into its design the need for EU policymakers. To take the results of that next uh, of that GST and feed them into the design of our next target. Okay, uh, <laughs> looking. I, the, the, the other thing is, you, you know, you said a little bit of a plus, a little bit of a minus, and kind of got kind of you 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 kind of net it into a bit of a mm -hmm. plus, but you know, it's relative. Is this would this kind of are we in the plateaus? Uh, like, has this has this whole crisis that's you know kind of driven this us to a plateau, or or is just a a normal pause because this was a cop with, with implementation? It wasn't that. I don't. I hope we're not on a plateau. We better not be on a plateau. But I, I think that part of the problem is is that cops happen every year, and I don't know of any domestic policy process that operates on a one year cycle. So you know the, the the points that we use to measure progress year after year after year, cop after cop after cop, are I guess you could argue might, might be too close together to be able to measure the longer term trends that we need to see in um, strengthening policy. So you know the, the EU found itself in a remarkable circumstance. Um, you know the, the the COVID crisis followed by the the the, the illegal invasion of Ukraine which caused us to reconsider our, uh, our target twice and is likely to generate more ambition in a compressed period of time than would otherwise be the case. But, but that's not true of, of every, every country. We have to keep the pressure on, but I, I don't think the fact that one year later, we're not seeing 190 countries updating their NDCs means that we've necessarily plateaued. It could be just that the, the measuring point is sort of too close to one another to show what the, the, the trend will, will look like. Um, not to say that I'm optimistic about this at all. I'm just saying that COPs create a kind of an artificial, particularly now with the Glasgow Annual Review, um, measurement uh, of, uh, of, of policy change. Okay, I'm, you know, it's very quirky because it, normally the people in the room are more active than the people on the on the on the screen, and in this case, the people in the room are kind of pulling teeth here, but I don't see them being active at all. But on the other hand, you know, it's like that the cop you can't if you sit in the chair, you cannot you cannot name. But they don't have they don't have flags. They don't have flags. Take one thing, you know, I, as you know, I shared response measures. Uh, you know that mm -hmm. I was, you know. See, the CBAM uh, had been introduced from the floor uh, in, in past sessions, SAFSA, and so on. You know, flags went up and they said it and they went away, essentially. You know, that's, you know, so my conclusion was they had a mandate from capital to raise the issue and then 
kind of you know, leave it alone. This was a little bit more insistent now, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was dropped. Uh, it was tactical, was this in, in your view? Because you know this stuff well. I mean, you, you know trade and, and climate. Uh, I'm sure it came back to you somehow in, in, with your negotiators. Is this was this tactically? Do, do you foresee that this is going to come back to us again in, in future sessions? It's going to become a bigger animal. Um, I, I think as more parties move towards implementation, they will have to turn to policies that affect trade. Uh, the fact that the EU is kind of a first mover as it as it comes to serious implementation of climate policies means that our trade related policies have emerged more quickly than other countries. But I think you can see, you know, with the the first piece of major legislation coming out of the United States, that they turned immediately to trade related policies as a way of trying to reconcile the need to invest significant amounts of, of, of federal money uh, into the development of new and deployment of new uh, and new technologies and the need to ensure that in doing so, they are protecting the competitiveness of, of U.S. industry. So they turned immediately uh, to, to a trade trade policy uh, from their domestic um, toolkit, the, uh, the domestic content requirement. So I think we'll see as more and more jurisdictions take, take policy implementation seriously, they will be looking for some way of achieving mul multiple domestic policy objectives uh, with their climate policies. So the fact that, that the, the CBAM um, proposal which hopefully will be uh, more than a proposal in the, in, in the coming weeks. Weeks mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you know it, it, that it was raised again in uh, in the response measures forum. I think the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, as I understand, was also referred to yeah. in that conversation as well. Yeah. And as we move from COP to COP, there will be more examples for um, countries to to look at um, and to, to hopefully learn from and, and take efforts to reduce tensions around. No, trade and, and look, uh, we have, a, I can, can promote ourselves, you know, we have a pretty good trade and climate change uh, team here in the RCSD. I'm not uh, leaving, I'm just getting some water. No, I didn't, that's my first. I think there's, is there water? That's what I worry about. If somebody can get water, but the water's so I, there's No, water. it would just. Do you like some as well? No, no, I'm fine. <laughs> no, yeah, we should, we have bad, bad hosts because we should have had water on the table. And I apologize for that. Uh, okay, the, uh, sorry, where were we because I got sidetracked with the water? Uh, response measure? Response measure. No, I mean, this is something that, uh, in my mind, I was surprised by the uh, the fact that it's stuck in there. For the moment, it's stuck in, in this particular working group, which is, you know what it is. Let's see whether it brings something in the case. Bill Thompson, you uh, joined the, the panelist. Bill? Bill? I, you're there, but you're not unmuting yourself. You have to unmute your microphone if you want to speak. Well, I mean, he's there, but he's not. Yeah. There you go. Thanks very much. Out of practice, I'm afraid. Uh, Jacob, thanks very much for making yourself available. Uh, I'm Bill Thompson, and I'm uh, one of the chairs for the UK Emission Trading Group, which is looking at implementation of, in particular, emission trading uh, systems and also uh, government policy. You mentioned the issue of the 1992 convention and this problem of the definition of developing countries list. Now, while not a problem in 1992, we're now 30 years on. And is this not going to continue to dog the future negotiations when some of the, the, the 1992 definition um, countries are now looking rather like developed nations, I mean, the rich oil nations, uh, some of the middle income countries, and, and perhaps the big one, which is, of course, China. So thinking of the future, uh, will the list be amended? Because it strikes me that um, unless the list is focused, there won't be enough funding to, to cover all the, the issues that are desired. Perhaps the focus on the UN definition of the least uh, least developing countries, the LDCs. Without that, surely future COPs are going to continue to uh, spend valuable negotiation time trying to avoid this particular problem, and that seems like a, a big a big issue to carry forward into future COPs. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on this, whether it can be amended or side sidetracked. 
Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. And there's a gentleman here in the, in the room, a courageous gentleman in the room. If you want to speak up, I'm not sure we have a handheld microphone. Uh, well, I can speak up. Uh, James Oldman of the Australian Federal Economic Chamber. And it's a bit of a less technical question, but the topic has raised some eyebrows in the Austrian business community because it has been reported by the Austrian media that Commissioner Timmermans has committed to minus 57% for some reason. And I was wondering if you see what there, what he actually said without having to read it in the Austrian media because it really has provoked some uproar in the Austrian business community. So do we stay with minus 65 hours there? Or did he say something completely different? It was just probably that's a quick one. But there, there was also something, I, I wasn't going to raise it, but since you raised it, there was also something that somebody brought to my attention. I have actually, is the only, you know, I, I live in Brussels, but I, live, I, I read the Brussels Times. I mm -hmm. you know, frankly, you know, reading the local press. Which is, you know, Francophone or Flemish, but there was something that uh, the Flemish minister also also raised uh, regarding some some statements that were made, and they seem to be somewhat contradictory. So I'm not quite sure where, uh, how you want to comment on that. I think it's putting you a little bit on the spot. Maybe. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, the question about the convention annex is: we we believe that we have left them behind in the sense that the Paris Agreement. It doesn't refer to them as all. Uh, the Paris Agreement does refer to developing countries and developed countries, but without the annexes as defining uh, who falls, which countries fall into which categories. So it then leaves us to you know the politics of the negotiations, but also the bilateral relationships to try to encourage as many countries that were classified uh, as developing in 1992 to act more and more like uh, developed countries. Um, and I think you can see progress in that, uh, in that effort in things like um, 20, uh, where you do have the uh, emerging economies agreeing by consensus um, to take actions that reflect an expectation that all emerging economies uh, should, uh, should, should live up to. So it's 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 more about politics now than it is about the convention annexes, and and I think you know we we wouldn't try uh, to formally amend the annexes, uh, but rather um, leave them behind uh, with the, with the Paris Agreement uh, now being the the instrument that really um, uh, maps out the way to the future. Um, in terms of the the. EU's current NDC. So we talked about what will happen with the, with the global stock take and our future NDC. Um, there has been an expectation set in Glasgow that all parties will make an effort to revisit and see whether they can strengthen the NDC. Uh, we, we know that the efforts that we've been doing to, to put in place the Fit for 55 package uh, together with, um, uh, with uh, uh, the, the the steps to, to increase energy efficiency and, and recover from from COVID has led to the possibility that you could model emissions reductions that go beyond uh, 55 uh, to, for example, 57. Two percent is kind of the conventional understanding of how much further the 55 the 55 package will will take us by by 2030. I'm sure the, the executive vice president um, chose his words very carefully when he mentioned this potential. Uh, and I think he probably said something like, as a result of all this work, the EU can raise the level of its end. But he leaves it, of course, to the European Council to decide whether to do so. Um, that's not within his remit to change the, the headline target. So, you know, there are three pathways forward with this. One is that when communicating what we mean by at least 55, we use the Fit for 55 package to say at least means at least 57, or, you know, it's, it's more than 55 and we think we can get another 2%. So that's kind of a communication strategy to show that we are being more ambitious. The second option, uh, which we will be taking, is to update the information that accompanies the NDC. It's what we call the ICTU, the information um, that communicates greater transparency and understanding of the uh, uh, of the NDC. So that data that we we submitted to the uh, to the Secretariat back in Paris hasn't changed since we uh, announced our at least forty percent target. 
because we didn't know what that information would look like until we've completed the 555 package. So we will be communicating uh, all that information to the Secretariat. And then the third option is that you actually change formally the headline target. And again, that's something that uh, will have to be decided by ministers or, or leaders before it would, it would happen in practice. In the meantime, we've got a lot of good stuff to communicate. I mean, within that package, there are what, 30 new targets, um, the 27 targets of the member states through the effort sharing. Uh, there, so there, there will be the, the renew, new renewables target. There'll be new, the, the new energy efficiency target. There'll be the new ETS target. So if the international community is looking for, for more targets from, from the EU, we've got more than enough. And, and they also have the benefit of being legally binding domestically um, you know, and part of the whole architecture of policies that um, uh, should give our, our partners confidence. There's one, one further intervener, Nadia Didikova, I think European Climate Foundation, I believe Nadia, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. You hear me good? We can hear you. I think that you muted yourself again. We, we uh, but go ahead, please. I think, okay. yeah, no, I, I think I should be fine. Uh, so, yeah, my question was uh, a little bit related to the India, uh, the proposal by India to phase out all fossil fuels uh, or phase down all fossil fuels, not only coal. Uh, we saw that as kind of a surprise given that India was blocking before language on 1.5 degrees. Uh, and we saw that it was supported by developing countries and the EU as well. So just wondering, unfortunately, of course, it didn't make it in the in the end uh, in the text, but what is the uh, prospects for next year COP for, for this language? And also, do you see this as kind of a positive signal for the Indian role in the G20 presidency next year since they are taking over uh, from Bali? So just, just to reflect on that, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, personally, I I really welcomed it. I think that and the the fact that India came forward with their long term strategy, their first long term strategy uh, at, at this COP, really did did show I think a lot of positive uh, goodwill from from India to make its uh, its fair contribution to Paris implementation. Um, you know, there were there were some who, who were concerned that broadening out the the phase down. Um, the political signal, it's not really a target, but the political signal around the phasing down of, of coal to include other fossil fuels um, was a, uh, a, carried the risk of taking the emphasis and the pressure off of coal, coal being the, the, the obvious low hanging fruit for many countries in terms of, of, of getting rid of a particular energy source. But you know, I think India very um, logically and persuasively argued that that may be the low-hanging fruit for some countries, uh, particularly the industrialized countries that have already begun to move away from coal. Um, but for other countries, there continues to be a significant dependence on coal. And um, while by committing to net zero, as, as India has, uh, for them it's by 2070, uh, you have to move on all fossil fuels. Um, you know, uh, to me, it, it you know it was a it, it was only fair to say that um, countries should be able to some extent choose the 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 fuels that they're they're targeting. Uh, so, you know, that's why the EU supported it in the end. We thought it did show more ambition to broaden the scope of the phase down target. We of course would have preferred, as we did in Glasgow, for it to be a phase out, um, but it did meet resistance and probably. The Egyptian um, COP presidency coming from a region that is uh, a major producer of natural gas was more reluctant to include it than maybe another COP presidency might have. I don't know, um, but it didn't. It, it didn't make it in. I think Jake, we're we're reaching towards the the end of the uh, Elena. I have also a question. Apologies if maybe you have already talked about this. I was busy with the IT stuff, but um, so the EU seems to be uh, a bit skeptical about um, linking again the EU ETS with the international mechanisms, specifically Article 6.4. Can you maybe elaborate a bit on this, like on the position of the EU, if like if you envision a possible link in the future, mm -hmm. maybe when the methodology is going to be ready? Is there, I mean, 
Okay, I, I, I know what the line is right now. We're, mm -hmm. not, we're not trying to force a, a discussion on, on, on to, to corner you on a, on a, on a no, no, on, no. On an answer that is it's, 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 a, it's a standard answer. But is there a, my, my question, you know, if I were to, to rewrite the question is, is there a point, is there a threshold where it, you'd be satisfied with the quality or is it the quality that is, is that the main problem or is it the, the, the simple uh, uh, concept that you, you, you should be doing these things at home? What is the public happening? I, at the moment, it's definitely both. I mean, the idea, I mean, the only context in which I can contemplate us responsibly considering the use of international offsets is to cover residual emissions, right? So as we're driving to net zero, and that is the whole point of the Paris Agreement is to drive to net zero, um, we will go through all sorts of um, challenging industrial transformations. I mean, things like net zero steel production. Um, that's, not, that's not going to be easy, but it's technologically possible and worth doing. And as long as you keep the pressure on through a high carbon price and through a confidence that the actions that you're taking are generating real emissions reductions, it seems to me there is no reason from a policy perspective to bring offsets uh, into the mix. Um, there will be a point in which we will find it's it we simply can't achieve all emissions reductions within our own economy and we'll have to turn to offsets to cover residual emissions but even that has to be done in a world in which you can be confident that by our using offsets we aren't creating incentives for other countries to um not act domestically with the same level of ambition, right? As you move to a net zero world, you have to be thinking about offsetting globally. Uh, and currently the Article 6.4 standards understandably can't you know, anticipate that level of, uh, of environmental integrity. So let's leave offsets for residual emissions. And in our current economy, there are so many opportunities for reducing emissions at source. Why would we open it up? Why would we lose the opportunity to drive towards net zero by allowing in, again, you know, large volumes of low quality, low cost offsets? Not related, so go ahead, please, because I, will, I think it's more important, you're more important, I can call Jake and ask him, but you, you go ahead. Yeah, sorry, you didn't know what was the best moment you got. No, 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 the, the best moment is, you are, you are, you have, you have to, you are on the few hardy ones that that showed up and then uh, happy to have you. Thanks. So I'm Emanuela Barbilaglia from Carbon Pools. And um, yeah, thank you anyway for everything. So I have actually three questions. So um, about the negotiations and Timmermans uh, of last offer, let's say, um, can you maybe elaborate a bit, a bit on what was behind the scenes. So which countries were on board, which other didn't really want that offer to be made. And um, in terms of Article 6, I don't know, maybe you talked about that, but just to be sure, do you think that that will mean the EU will use um, international credits for uh, raising ambition in the future? Um, with mitigation ambition. And um, finally, um, for loss and damage, uh, do you have any idea of what will happen? I know that we still have like one year, a couple of years, we don't know exactly how it works, but uh, to build this fund, but does it mean that China will be supposed to pay at this point and uh, how will that work? And also, will that apply also to other summit finance legs or adaptation and mitigation or just like that? Last, last question, Jake. So uh, <laughs> I think it is it is getting yeah. late and uh, it, uh, we should have started at four. I'm not sure why I did four thirty, but go ahead. Yeah. So maybe I'll I'll just end. I, th I think I addressed the offsets issues. Yes. But um, so the the politics behind the offer that Timmermans made about um, yes, we'd be prepared to support the establishment of a of a fund here, 
but on the condition that the fund added value by addressing in particular the vulnerable uh, developing countries uh, and that it had the potential to get money from more than just the conventional donor base. Who would that have upset? Well, it, it would have upset um, some developed countries that thought that we could survive Charm without creating a fund. I think our calculation was that that was becoming an, a political impossibility because the G77, uh, the media, the NGOs were all using the creation of a fund as a kind of litmus test for success. And we had already seen a number of the industrialized countries beginning to signal that they're prepared to accept the G77 proposal. We couldn't accept the G77 proposal because it described a fund that was based on the convention, on the 1992 structure. So it would be based on what's called Article 11 of the Framework Convention, which essentially means all developing countries, as defined in 1992, would be equally eligible, and only developed countries, and the richer amongst them, would be expected to pay into it. So that fund wouldn't work for us and, and shouldn't work for, for anyone. So by saying we could accept a fund, but only under these terms, we probably irritated some of the developed countries who thought that we could survive the COP without establishing a fund at all. And we certainly irritated some of the G77 who thought that they could insist on the fund re remaining within the boundaries of the convention. So all developing countries eligible and um, only developed countries expected to pay. The landing ground is kind of a mixture of things. Um, it definitely says that it's developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change that the fund is designed to support, but it doesn't define who the particularly vulnerable are. So it doesn't actually act to exclude any developing country from eligibility, but it clearly sends a signal that as, as, as and when this fund begins to prioritize its investments, it has to focus on the particularly vulnerable. And in everyone's mind, that is and should be that the least developed countries, uh, small island developing states, and, and frankly, vulnerable communities elsewhere. But um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not there to help high middle income people from Pakistan who are already insured for the kinds of impacts that you saw, for example, right? <laughs> Uh, in terms of opening up the fund to potentially be able to get money from China uh, and, and other potential donors that aren't part of the conventional donor base, that's all to be negotiated as part of the design of the fund. It's going to be very difficult to get an explicit commitment from China to support this fund. But we, you know, we certainly try. And there's language in uh, this text that has never been agreed before by consensus. The idea that we will be identifying and expanding sources of funding, we've never agreed to language like that before. So there is a real kind of threshold that we've crossed, I think. Obviously, that part of the deal and this landing ground um, irritated uh, some of the emerging economies. They would prefer that that, that not, not be the case, um, but uh, hopefully uh, made the uh, the constituency that we were most concerned about, which were the vulnerable countries, a little bit happier um, that we will create a fund with this decision that will add value by focusing on their concerns and opening up the opportunity to, to raise more resources than we otherwise have been. And that was our point. Jake, thanks. Uh, you know, just been a pleasure to have you here. Just has been a pleasure working with your colleague in in in, uh, in Sharp. And uh, I have to say this, and I will say it again. I mean, I'm, I speak my mind at this point in my life in my career. I continue to be astounded that we have senior EU policy uh, officers from from the Commission and from the in general from the institution talking about international discussions. But there is, you know, there are people on the screen, but there, is, there are less people in the room and there's less activity because this is important. The uh, Europe EU policy is not disconnected for the international policy. I think these are very important. These are opportunities in our mind to both get information, but also kind of feedback uh, their thoughts of how things uh, have gone and, and what the reactions are. 
But nevertheless, I think that we have a good audience, uh, good questions. And Jake, I know that you're busy and I know you're tired. I know a lot of people, I know my American friends, they're all on, on Thanksgiving weekend right now and they have disappeared out in, in nature. But uh, you've joined us and I very much appreciate that. And, and we'd like to, you to join me in thanking Jake for the interest.